the, uh, the three composers whose works we're hearing today received much praise in Germany in the 1920s, but also much criticism. Criticism, which after Hitler became chancellor, changed to severe attacks. Mendelssohn, of course, was out of earthly reach. For the other two, Erwin Schulhoff and Anton von Webern, 1933 marked the onset of a new phase of, in their careers, which ended with their death and Germany's defeat in 1945. Each man's compositions were rather different, but they were attacked for the same underlying reason. Hitler's concept of the arts as an arena of ideological and political conflict in which good and evil forces fought over the nation's present and future. Seventy years ago, the non-German non world did not attribute that degree of political significance to the arts, nor does it today. But what may seem to us an absurdly exaggerated concern over stylistic differences in aesthetic media was for Hitler a serious political strategy which he turned into, an, into a component of National Socialist rule. The attacks on Schulhoff and Webern for writing atonal or 12-tone music conformed to this strategy. The two men differed socially and politically, demonstrating, if they were necessary, the broad reach of modernism. Webern, politically conservative, came from an old upper-class family. Schulhoff was not only to the left, but a Jew, which in Hitler's eyes made him a pretended German, whose work posed a subversive and therefore particularly dangerous threat to German values. To make matters worse, Schulhoff not only wrote radically experimental music, he aggressively quarreled with opponents of modernism in print. An example is his response to a conservative music journal which in 1925 accused American popular music of stimulating immorality, singling out the saxophone as an instrument of particular tonal depravity. That at the time, Schulhoff was working on the piano pieces he published the following year as five jazz studies, five études de jazz. Incidentally, they were played uh, last Sunday at the Frick. That didn't increase his patience with ideology masking as music criticism. Far from immoral, he wrote, Playing the saxophone was erotically healthy. Of all instruments, it best expressed both human and animalistic emotions. And whatever scientific question remained, Professor Siegmund Freud was about to answer in an addendum to his book, Totem and Taboo, entitled The Saxophone as Fetish. <laughs> the third composer in our group Today, Felix Mendelssohn could be accused neither of modernism nor of bad manners. He was guilty of the opposite. His music was criticized as too smooth, melodies that seduced listeners and corrupted their taste and ideals with values that were shallow, derivative, innately un-German. Schulhoff's and Webern's experiences and the treatment Mendelssohn's works received are in many respects representative of German musical history for the 12 years beginning with 1933. In turn, these years marked by disagreements over what was and was not acceptable to compose, to perform, and to hear were part of a much broader conflict between national socialism and modernism in the arts in general. And that makes it worthwhile to ask what brought these culture wars about and what course did this culture war take from somewhat uncertain beginnings
through the increasingly intense drive toward a radically changed relationship between the arts, their public, and the state. Hitler took the arts more seriously than did other political leaders of the time, and his personal interest helped him early on to recognize their potential political value. As he fought his way to power, he came to understand that the arts, if intelligently used, could be weapons in the political wars. Victory achieved, they could become tools to create the degree of intellectual and emotional cohesion and discipline that the National Socialists demanded not only to assure its own continued rule, but also to prepare society for the conflicts accompanying Germany's future expansion. Hitler recognized two general social and cultural developments, which if they could be made to interact, would open the door to the political exploitation of the arts he had in mind. One of these developments was the growth of mass society with its gradual expansion of political participation, whether real or symbolic. The other was the quickening rate of change in artistic expression. In a society no longer politically inert, in which even the poor now had a few years of schooling, some people, and perhaps many, might react with confusion and hostility to works of art that kept replacing conventional representations of reality with radically new ways of seeing or hearing. Landscapes no longer painted in recognizable shapes and colors, but as abstractions, chamber music with folk song motifs turning atonal. Events confirmed Hitler's speculation that in a democratic political system, which was socially and economically battered by the First World War, one way of mobilizing people's support uh, for reactionary politics was to alert them to works they would regard as senseless or revolting, but works that nevertheless were praised in newspapers, were exhibited or performed, and were given prizes by the state. A composition or painting that the uninitiated could not understand, or that with its rejection of the accustomed, they understood only too well as belittling their values, could become a symbol of the discontinuities now cutting through society. A sustained campaign of political exploitation could make modernism in the arts a visible and audible example of the social, economic, and ideological forces that challenged accepted values and threatened change in all areas of life. <coughs> Abstraction or atonality would give tangible form to the specters of communism and of international Jewish capitalism. These, I mean, I'm summarizing his ideas, and these ideas uh, turned out to be remarkably effective. And it is ironic, but the art journalism of the time makes it very clear that some forms of modernism ap actually help encourage this kind of political exploitation. I say that because at least since the early 19th century, the phrase épaté le bourgeois, to shock and dumbfound the middle classes, was as slogan and purpose inseparable from modernism in its broad cultural dimension. The phrase identifies one of the elements feeding the alienation that accompanied the class divisions in European industrialized society. Most people, after all, were not bourgeois, but workers, workers in factories, offices, and on the land. As society expanded in size and complexity, 
more of its members could be made aware of art and of the continuing changes in art that to them were inexplicable, shocking. Changes largely created by middle-class artists and composers who in their musical scores, paintings, and sculptures acted out ideas, problems, conflicts that working class people had neither the leisure nor the means to worry about. And the aggressive aesthetics of some forms of German modernism, say German expressionism, exemplify a modernism that whatever its qualities could give politicians the opportunity to exploit for their own ends the disturbing characteristics of these works. I suggested a minute or two ago that Hitler's genuine interest in the arts, however pronounced its pathology, led him to recognize that the strangeness of some forms of modernism could be used politically. His interest also shaped the political specifics that this insight brought about. Once he became the leader of a totalitarian Germany, he would not prolong the art's freedom from government control, but guide and limit the public's access to aesthetic ideas and interpretations. And yet, he was not averse to modernism as such. Under his urging, the Third Reich sought out modern design and tried to integrate it in mass culture, from the reshaping of the countryside by the Autobahn the industrialization of everyday existence through the Volkswagen, to the design of furniture, lamps, dishes, and cutlery, which more than matched the modern characteristics of similar products in Western Europe and in this country. Since his youth, he valued some forms of modernism in music and in the fine arts, Wagner's late operas, for instance. Another early example of Hitler's receptivity to the new was his admiration of Max Klinger, an important innovator, incidentally a teacher of Peter Kollwitz, one of whose works was a large multi-material polychrome sculpture of Beethoven. At the centerpiece of the 1902 exhibition of the Vienna Secession, this sculpture became a modernist cultural icon. Years later, in 1920, and in a political speech in a beer hall, no less, Hitler recalled this work as exemplifying the true artist's honest inner experience which his closeness to the ordinary German allowed him to express, an inspiration to those who saw it, unlike the superficial and derivative facility of Jewish artists who were internationally oriented who could only confuse and corrupt. In short, Hitler accepted works of modern art in a variety of forms and styles as long as they had what he considered healthy subjects and as long as they treated these subjects descriptively or with humor or idealized them as Klinger idealized Beethoven. He rejected distortion in the arts and he rejected their exploration of psychological conflict or social misery, which happened to be frequent stylistic and thematic characteristics of modernism. Hitler praising Klinger's Beethoven to his beer-drinking rowdies brings up another issue that helped shape the cultural situation of these years. The arts were of little concern to most party members unless incomprehensible or offensive art had helped bring them to the party in the first place. But some intellectuals among leaders and the rank and file did attribute great significance to the arts. Hitler therefore needed to educate his movement to the political importance of this area and needed to feel his way carefully in developing his policies as the arts became enmeshed in intra-party conflicts, whether ideological or competitions for power. 
An example was the, the rivalry continuing over years between Goebbels, who combined a ferocious anti-Semitism with great interest in modernism, and Rosenberg, the senior official charged with overseeing the ideological purity of the party, whose aesthetics were brutally backward-looking. In 1929, Rosenberg had founded the League for German Culture, a pressure group to defend tradition and oppose modernism, which he hoped to turn into the dominant cultural authority of the national socialist state. Hitler, as was his practice, allowed his subordinates to fight each other to a standstill before he imposed a decision. And consequently, even after he gained power, the new government's cultural policies remained for a time uncertain. Over Rosenberg's objections, some national socialists attempted to carve out a permissible Nordic modernism. And Hitler's intentions being not yet clear, party leaders filled the vacuum with their own policies. Concerts and exhibitions prohibited in some parts of Germany were permitted in others, and it was possible to think that as the party became accustomed to govern, it would modify its extremes of rhetoric and policy. In the first two years of the Third Reich, inconsistency was the rule. In October 1933, for instance, the annual piano competition in Berlin was still held under its old name, the Mendelssohn Prize. And as late as November 1934, the premiere of Alban Berg's symphonic suite based on his 12-tone opera, Lulu, scored a public success. Another episode that seemed to indicate some latitude was the conflict in 1934 over Hindemith's opera, Matis de Mahler. A planned production in Frankfurt was canceled, yet in Berlin, Wilhelm Furtwängler, after Richard Strauss, the most prominent conductor in Germany, performed the premiere of the suite based on the opera to enthusiastic approval. Works of Hindemith were given elsewhere in Germany, even as he was attacked for his earlier, more experimental compositions. But when, Furtwänger, when Furtwängler defended Hindemith in a national newspaper, Goebbels took it as an attack on his authority. He forced the conductor to withdraw his opposition, and the battle over the acceptance of Hindemith's works in the new Germany was lost even if Hindemith still waited some years before immigrating. Eventually, after a period of uncertainty, the effort to create a permissible Nordic modernism failed. Hitler's very broad definition of unwanted art and the use of undesirable music as a symbol for alien forces that threatened the German people's sense of self remained part of his cultural policies. No one could be surprised that he linked the elimination of evil art to the elimination of Jews. Jews and the creator of destructive art or destructive music became identical. After the Nuremberg laws were introduced, the percentage of Jewish ancestry in an individual was carefully calculated and could become a matter of life and death. Erwin Schulhoff died in a Bavarian concentration camp. But policy could twist in strange ways when the regime's quasi-scientific measurements clashed with reality, which is always, as we know, haphazard. Often the accepted view of race failed to match expected behavior. Hindemith, married to a woman with one Jewish grandfather, was himself a Gentile. Hitler nevertheless referred to him as Jewish ever since he had attended a uh, performance of Hindemith's opera, Neues von Tage, in 1929 and found it immoral and destructive of German values. 
Hitler's mistaken assumption, which played a role in the Hindemith affair I just mentioned, illustrates how the, propagandic, uh, the propagandistic use of art to symbolize forces threatening Germany's cultural destruction became as one with the racial threat. In this case, personified by Paul Hindemith, the non-Jew who nevertheless behaved like a Jew. In the end, the offensive work of art was no longer merely a symbol, but itself became the enemy, so that Matis der Mahler polluted both its German creator and its German public. Despite the, the logic of Hitler's determination to eliminate this Judeo-cultural complex and the consequentiality, the consequentiality of his increasing increasingly extreme methods to achieve his goal, the ideas underlying his cultural policies always had something blurred, fuzzy about them. And notwithstanding the enormous power of the network of government and police agencies that he constructed to implement his policies, the network too had odd quirks and inconsistencies. Germany, as you know, was a federation of states, each of which possessed important powers. Hitler greatly increased the central government's reach, but the old dichotomy between the center and the individual states was not completely resolved. In fact, Hitler added to it by imposing a third structure on the central and state governments, that of the National Socialist Party. Party members infiltrated and to varying degree took control of the government ministries and agencies, but that doesn't mean that party offices dealing with the same subjects were now shut down. The result was that various agencies and various individuals claimed authority or parts of, over the same area or parts of the same area. Competing coexistence resulted in a net of authority and control covering the country, but also a net of rivalries which factions or individuals could exploit to alleviate repression or to make it harsher. An, in, an official who knew how to play off the central and state governments and the party authorities against each other could hound an artist into professional non-existence or could create a small pocket of relative immunity for an artist to submerge and wait better days. In this maze of unintended chaos behind a facade of unanimity and disciplined uniformity, Goebbels, against opposition of other senior officials, but with Hitler's tacit approval, added a new agency to the Ministry for Propaganda, the Reich Chamber of Culture. The new organization made Rosenberg's League for German Culture obsolete and gave Goebbels far-reaching authority over the production and dissemination of the arts. The mission of the, the Reichskulturkammer was to advance German culture, ensure its responsibility toward the German people and the Reich, and regulate the economic and social activities of the cultural profession. It consisted of seven chambers, each covering one broadly defined discipline. A president and council at the head of each chamber coordinated its activities with the relevant agency in the ministry, both of them reporting to Goebbels. For the first two years, the president of the music chamber, the Reichsmusikkammer, was Richard Strauss, not a national socialist, indeed he had a Jewish daughter-in-law, but a man whose principal concern besides protecting the interests of composers by strengthening copyright laws, was to be left alone to compose and have his work performed as he saw fit, which is exactly the kind of freedom that no one in Germany possessed any longer. Strauss's international reputation benefited the regime, but he was forced to resign after the Gestapo intercepted a letter uh, to the Jewish librettist of his opera, Die Schweigsame Frau, 
in which Strauss had carelessly written that the only reason he served as president of the music chamber was to prevent bad things from happening. Members of the music chamber were composers, musicians, music teachers, builders of instruments, concert administrators, agents, many thousands of individuals active in the production and dissemination of music in Germany. Applicants could be rejected and members could be terminated on professional and on racial grounds. At first, Jews, especially if they'd served in the World War, were still accepted. But by March 1936, Goebbels had weeded out 2,002 Jews or people with a Jewish grandparent, besides many Gentiles who were married to Jews or had spouses with three Jewish grandparents. A rejection or expulsion might mean professional death, since only members of the chamber could be legally employed in music. Composers or performers of 12-tone or 8-tonal music could belong if they still had appropriate sponsors. That was the case with Anton von Webern, who remained a member even after he was officially denounced as a major practitioner of 12-tone music. Webern, politically far to the right, with close relatives in the party, evidently had a protector. Still, he was not allowed to perform or teach. He barely earned a living as proofreader and making piano transcriptions for a music publisher. In 1940, he appealed to the music chamber for support and received a one-time gift of 250 mark. But his music was forbidden. Shortly after the end of the war, at night outside his house near Salzburg, he was accidentally shot and killed by an American soldier who thought that Webern was attacking him. The Reichsmusikkammer controlled music by granting or withholding the right to work. It also entered the fight for new German music by means of week-long annual conferences. The first of these music days of the Reich in May 1938, headed Music and Race, sought to deepen understanding both of Jewish aesthetics and of what was called the essential German nature of such composers as Handel and Mozart, despite their use of foreign libretti, and in Mozart's case, collaboration with the Jewish Lorenzo da Ponte. Performances of classical and contemporary works meant to demonstrate the healthy condition of music in Germany now had the added ideological mission of destroying the class barriers that kept great music the property of small cultural elites. No épaté le bourgeois here as the program declared, the most sublime art must be available to all. And joined to these first music days of the Reich was an exhibition of degenerate music, copied after the exhibition of degenerate art. How this edition came about and its subsequent history again illustrates the often confused interaction of government and party. A senior official in the propaganda ministry, Hans Severus Ziegler, as one of the earliest members of the party, a man of great privilege, whose position now was threatened because his homose homosexuality had become known, decided to organize an event that would give him both prestige and political cover. And he settled on an exhibition of prohibited music. Richard Strauss's successor as president of the Reichsmusikkammer, the musicologist Peter Rabe, opposed the project when he learned of it. It, it would be a mistake, he wrote, to attack works that no one played anymore, and it was wrong to claim that anyone who had briefly explored atonality was politically suspect and also a bad artist. Atonal music Rabe said was a temporary illness caught by gifted people whose character and patriotism were beyond 
question. But it was too late to cancel the exhibition without embarrassing the ministry, and it opened in Dusseldorf, though Goebbels instructed the press to limit its coverage. The show was not a great success. In contrast to the exhibition of degenerate art with its hundreds of original works, it could offer little beyond images and caricatures with scurrilous texts of modernist composers and musicians, either Jews or Gentiles influenced by Jews. The most interesting part was a row of listening booths in which visitors could play recordings of degenerate music. It closed early, but having gained some ideological momentum, it was moved to Weimar, Munich, and finally to Vienna. Although the show was, although the show was poorly planned, am I doing this? Or? <laughs> Maybe a National Socialist ghost is interfering. <laughs> the show was poorly planned and was unimpressive, but it did contribute to the government's ultimate aim by demonstrating to the public the full weight of official opposition to music unsuitable to the new Germany. To reveal and eliminate these works was, of course, only once one side of cultural policy. There was another side, its complement the creation of a new German music. But in this second mission, the music days and the show failed, just as the exhibition of degenerate art with its associated great German art exhibition failed to advance new German painting and sculpture. When Hitler inspected the works collected for this first compilation of approved new German art, he was enraged by their mediocrity, and he was tempted to cancel the show. Then he decided uh, that it should go uh, forward anyway, but he declared, and he declared that all National Socialism could do was to root out the corruption of German culture and give new talent opportunities to grow, but it could not guarantee whether the present generation would experience a new spring of creativity. This statement applies as much to music as to the fine arts. Had the Third Reich lasted longer, we can't say whether composers would have emerged who had earlier avoided the traps of atonality and other forms of modernism and now wrote significant music. We can't say that, but we do know that after 1933, none of the younger composers, untouched by modernism, wrote anything that lasted. A few others who, before 1933, had been influenced by modernistic trends and had contributed to them, did write substantial music. Probably the three most significant are Werner Eck, once strongly affected by jazz, attracted to it, whom the regime rewarded with important appointments and commissions. Karl Amadeus Hartmann, a left-wing socialist who was not permitted to publish his music or have it performed, and Karl Orff, who in the 20s associated with such left-wing writers as Bertolt Brecht, uh, and then retreated from experimentation to styles more acceptable in the Third Reich. In 1937, despite a hostile review in the Völkische Beobachter, the party's principal newspaper, he achieved a great success with his scenic cantata Carmina Burana. He composed and was performed to the end of the Third Reich, and as you know, many of his works are still played today. But as one of his grandmothers was Jewish, he could not be put forward as a leader of the new pure German music. In short, although the destructive side of National Socialist cultural policy succeeded, its constructive counterpart was a failure. This outcome had less to do with the political orientation 
of the individual artist than with the extreme intolerance of the official and unofficial political environment. Serious work has always been produced by artists of every political persuasion. Anton von Webern is certainly an important figure in the history of modern music. He was also a nationalist, for a time even an admirer of Hitler, pretty much the kind of person the Third Reich was looking for in its artists. And yet, Webern was an unreconstructed modernist. From the point of view of the arts, it was a misfortune for the Third Reich that Hitler did not follow the lead of Mussolini's fascism, which until Italy became a battleground in the Second World War, coexisted easily with various forms of modernism long excluded from Germany. But Mussolini never went as far as Hitler in politicizing the arts. Good art has often been made under repressive regimes, either in subversive opposition to its measures or in agreement with them or by ignoring them as much as possible as Richard Strauss did. But after the first few years of the Third Reich, the policy of re repression had reached levels of intensity that no one could ignore. Hitler's vision of totality subsumed every element of society and culture, from politics to war, from art to ethnicity, under the same ideological demand. He formulated a new general law, which by identifying race as the force underlying politics generated vast new energies, the more so since many people founded a convincing explanation of the social and political universe. But the conditions for survival in this universe and the effort required to meet them made the birth and development of new creativity, as contrasted with holdovers from an earlier period, very difficult. The individual artist may combine seemingly contradictory political and aesthetic ideas, but it is one thing to manipulate ideas freely in an environment that affords scope to diversity and another to do so under the constant threat of physical repression and indeed of extinction. For creativity to move in new directions in the closed society of the Third Reich, to break away from officially approved norms and survive in the face of organized terror was so difficult as to approach the impossible. Whether the circumstances of that time and place can be generalized to apply to comparable conditions in the future is a question that may be worth asking even if it can't be answered. Thank you. <laughs>